Hey everyone, it's Andrew here at Vespa Portland, and what I've got with me here tonight is a 50cc Vespa Sprint in the Racing 60s edition. We're going to cover the features and functions of the Vespa Sprint 50cc scooter in this video, but before we get too far into that, we're going to cover what's required to legally operate the scooter. Most people who look at 50cc scooters are newer riders and have a lot of questions about what's required to ride. So our shop's located in Portland, Oregon, and just a few miles north of us over the bridge is Washington State. And I can tell you that in both of our states here, uh, all of these scooters that are 50cc are considered mopeds by the DMV. That means you don't need a special motorcycle endorsement to ride these legally. All you need is a driver's license in Oregon and Washington. That said, Oregon and Washington still classify these as vehicles, just like a car. So you're still going to have to title and register the scooter with the DMV and pay all the normal fees and taxes and carry insurance, uh, vehicle insurance, motorcycle insurance. You're also going to need a DOT approved helmet and have to wear that while you ride the scooter. Additionally, 50cc scooters in Oregon and Washington have to follow the exact same rules of the road as any car or truck. That means no riding on the sidewalk, no riding in a bike lane, and you also can't split lanes like you can in California or Montana or I think Utah as well. Lane splitting will probably be legalized in Oregon at some point, but riding on the sidewalk and riding in a bike lane, probably gonna be off limits forever. If you're in another state, you're just going to want to check your local laws. So to the south of us in California, you actually need a full motorcycle endorsement to ride even a 50cc scooter. In some other states, you might not need an endorsement, a driver's license, insurance, or even a helmet. It really varies that much in this category of vehicle. That all said, even if your specific state doesn't require you to have any formal motorcycle training, we still highly recommend that you take some kind of a motorcycle safety course, whether it's through a state or a community college or some private company, or at minimum, go through YouTube and, and search for things like, things I wish I knew as a, as a new rider. Immerse yourself in some kind of education. It could literally save your life. But that's enough preaching from me. So let's get on to the 50cc sprint and uh, check it out. The Sprint 50 is a sporty, stylish, metal-bodied, fuel-injected, lightweight scooter that's great for any in-city use. Your top speed is going to be somewhere between 30 and 35 miles an hour on flat ground, depending on how long the road is and how much time you have to get there. But ultimately, you're going to land somewhere around 30 miles an hour, which is what keeps you in that moped class as far as the DMV is concerned. With this scooter, it's going to be fun and easy to get around town, a small town, inner city, whatever, you know, go get an ice cream, ride to your friend's house, go get a coffee and a breakfast burrito, just enjoy the sunshine and watch everybody smile at you as you ride by, that sort of thing. 50cc scooters are slower and not super highly powered and just fun to ride as well. So there's a lot of fun things you can do on this bike around your neighborhood, around your town, whatever. It's a good little bike to get started on. The only time that a 50cc scooter might not really be the right tool for the job is if you want to commute some, you know, long, long distance. Sometimes we have people come in saying, I've got a 10 mile commute one way. Should I get this bike? It's kind of at the edge of what it's really meant to do. You should probably get something a little faster because at some point you're going to be tired of the amount of time it takes to go 10 miles on a 50. Um, you're probably going to want to hit some higher speed roads in, you know, higher speed being 40 miles an hour, 45 miles an hour. Think of the 50 for very short trips. You live within five miles of your job or, you know, you're, you're going around a smaller central area. Beyond that, you're probably going to want something a little faster. That's going to require you to take the motorcycle endorsement uh, test and class in your state. Uh, but that might be what you need to do if you have bigger aspirations than just kind of going around a small area. The other thing uh, that you should consider is if you live on a hill or you have a lot of hills in your life, that the 50cc scooter, doesn't matter really which one, any of them, uh, Vespa or not, is just going to be quite a bit slower on hills. So when I said earlier 30 to 35 miles an hour on flat ground, you can expect that to drop into the low to mid 20s on a hill, depending on how steep it is. And that is if you are full throttle at the bottom of the hill and don't come off of it. If you're on the way up a hill and you come off the throttle and then try to gain it back, you're just gonna, you're never really gonna gain it back. The engine just doesn't have that in it. It's, it's meant to be slower. It's meant to not be super powerful. So you got a lot of hills in your life as well. I would recommend a faster scooter, a little more power, uh, 125, 150, uh, something that can get you to the posted speed limits and beyond on a hill. The good news is if you decide to bump up to the quicker bike from a 50cc to a 150 on a Vespa, you're actually going to be looking at a bike that looks almost identical. So Vespa uses the same 
frame and internals and ergonomics on their 50cc scooters as well as the 150cc. Blindfolded, if I was sitting on this, I wouldn't know which one I was sitting on. Um, it's just faster with the 150 and more powerful. So if you need that power bump, just select the one you like in the bigger size. All right, now we'll get to the functions and features of the scooter. We're gonna start down here at the key and the ignition. We'll check out the glove box while we're down there and then we'll head up to the handlebars, the controls, the dashboard, and then down toward the wheels and toward the rear of the bike to round it out. At the end of this, we'll talk colors, we'll talk pricing, we'll talk availability. That's a big one at this time of filming, January 2022. The ignition has a lock, a close, an off and an on position from the left to the right side. In the lock position, that's a steering lock. You're going to want to lock your steering every single time you're out in public. And it's a good idea, especially if you're a new rider, to also lock your steering in the garage where you're storing your bike, just to get in the habit of doing it. Turn the handlebars all the way to the left, followed by turning the key all the way to the left to the lock position. And that's going to lock the handlebars and make it harder for someone to walk away with your scooter. I see way too many scooters out and about in public where the handlebars are straightforward when the bike is parked. That means the steering is not locked and anybody can just walk away with the scooter. The next position you can see is close. Now what close does is allows you to move the handlebars freely, but does not let anybody into your storage compartments. Close is for the Asian or European markets where there are so many scooters ridden around and parked on all the streets that someone might have to move some scooters to get to theirs. Maybe the way someone parked blocked them in and they just have to slightly move it around. It allows them to maneuver other scooters so they can get their own bike out and get on with their day. Not really a thing in the US, but these bikes go all over the world, so the close feature is going to be on every bike worldwide. In the lock position and in the close position, you can put the key in and you can also remove the key. One click over to the right from the close position is the off position. In the off position, you cannot take the key out of the scooter, but you can press in on it to open up the glove box. The next position over is the on position. That's going to draw battery to power up the display, which is part of the process of starting the scooter itself, which we'll cover in a bit. In the on position, as far as the key itself physically goes, you can also press in to open up the glove box and you cannot remove the key in the on position. To do that, you're gonna to have to click back twice to the close or all the way to the lock to pull the key out. Inside the glove box on the right side, you're going to see a bank of fuses. On the right side there, you've got a little compartment, not huge, but you can put some things in there, your registration, your insurance, whatever. On the left side of the scooter, you have more storage. And then right here, you actually have a USB port. It's a really popular thing for people to do to put a phone mount up on the mirror, run a cable out through the glove box and up to the phone to charge it while they are riding. All right, next up, we'll talk about the handlebar controls. To start everything up, I'm just gonna turn the key to the on position and the dashboard is going to light up. On the dashboard here, you're going to see miles per hour in the larger white numbers and kilometers an hour in the smaller red numbers. Below, you have the gas gauge. You can see this bike is totally full. You can see the total miles on the bike. Right now, 17. This is a bike that people have taken a few test rides on. And then below that, you have the time, the clock. Some other things will show up on here as well as you use the controls next to the left and right grips, which we'll show you now. On the left side of the handlebars, you have four controls. You have your rear brake, your high beam switch, your turn signal switch, and the horn. Starting with the high beam switch, your headlight is always gonna be on when the bike is running, but you can turn the high beam on and off by sliding the switch left and right. When the high beam is engaged, you'll see a blue light on the dashboard. Below the high beam, you have the turn signals. The turn signals are going to slide to the left or to the right, and then to cancel them, you're going to press in on the button. They do not cancel on their own. I would recommend doing this periodically while you ride. You know, sometimes you're out cruising around just on a straight line and if you check it, oh, it clicked. Wait a minute, how long was that on? Um, you might've forgotten to turn it off after making a turn and then you're riding down the street signaling to other drivers that a, a turn that you're not gonna make. Uh, you could potentially have somebody turn right in front of you into your path. I've done that more times than I care to admit. So as you ride, just randomly check it. See, make sure it's off. The turn signal light also shows up on the dashboard. It's on the right side. Whether or not you click to the left or the right, you will see two arrows uh, pointing each direction flashing. 
That's your indication that the turn signal is on. It doesn't make any noise. Down below that, you have the horn. Uh, it sounds like this. On the right side of the handlebars, you have the front brake right here. You have a kill switch right here. Underneath that is a mode button. And underneath that is the electric start switch. The kill switch is meant to allow you to turn the engine off without having your hands leave the handlebars. If you're riding along, you need to, something goes wrong and you just need to turn the bike off, you slide over and the engine will cut out. Note that it has two positions. On this side, you have that same open loop like you see on the ignition with an X on it. And on this side, you have an open loop with no X. That's the no run direction and this is the run direction. Later on when we start the scooter, the kill switch is going to need to be in the rightmost position or the scooter will not start. The next switch down is the mode button. Uh, it just pushes in in the middle. And pressing on the mode button will take you between total miles, trip odometer A, trip odometer B, and then back to total miles. If you're at the gas station and you want to see how many miles you get out of the next tank of gas, you could go to a trip odometer and then press and hold on the mode button and it will clear out the number to zero. On the total miles setting, this is where you would change the clock. The scooter clock isn't smart enough to understand the concept of daylight saving time, so you have to update the clock at least twice a year on your own. Uh, we often do it for you when you come in for a service if you happen to have not done it. Uh, on total miles, you're going to press and hold on the mode button and it's going to make the hour start flashing. It's short presses to advance and then long presses to set. I'm gonna put it right back to the same time. So I'm doing short presses until I get to eight. It's actually not eight, it's seven. So this was a pre-daylight uh, saving time bike. Seven o'clock, press and hold to set, just like any alarm clock in your house and it's 7.06 right now. So I'm just going to skip the, the short presses and just press and hold to set the time. You see it goes back to how it was. You can't set the time while you're moving, you have to be stopped. I would hope you're not trying to set your clock while also trying to ride. The next switch down is the electric start. Now, since we're here, we might as well talk about how to get the scooter started. I've reset the bike to a parked state where the handlebar lock is engaged, the steering lock is engaged and what you're gonna to do to start the scooter. You're gonna walk up to it, you're gonna pop your key in there and then turn the key to the closed position at minimum so that you can unlock the bars. At that point, um, once you're ready to go, your helmet's on, all that stuff, you're gonna turn your key all the way to the left and the dashboard is going to pop on. You're gonna check that your kill switch is not uh, to the off position, you're gonna push it that way. Then you're gonna hold a brake on either side of the scooter. It could be the front one or it could be the back brake, it doesn't matter. Hold the brake and press the electric start. And there you have it, the scooter starts right up. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this thing off in reverse. When you park, come to a stop, kill the engine, get off the bike, put it on the center stand, turn your bars all the way to the left, turn your key all the way to the left to lock the steering and you are done. I'm gonna take you underneath the scooter now to see the center stand. So it is right here. You can see that it has two different points of contact with the ground, there and over there. The center stand is a very stable way to keep the scooter up. I'm shaking it with my right hand. The scooter is not really going anywhere. Taking the bike off the lift now, I'm gonna show you how the center stand works. You're gonna to wanna to hold on to the bars right here and then something static, whether it's the seat or the grab rail, either way. And then you simply just wanna push forward and the center stand will retract and the scooter will be ready to ride. When you want to put it back on the stand, pretty simple stuff, you need to keep the seat flat. The stand underneath uh, has two posts. If you have a flat seat, both the posts are going to contact the ground evenly and it's gonna be real easy to get this thing on the stand. If you lean the thing towards you, a lot of new riders do this, they really lean it far back as they're fighting it or sometimes ahead, then you're going to be fighting yourself and fighting this design of the stand. This is not meant to be used uh, pivoting around one post. Flat seat, open up your right hip and stick your heel on the center stand. Hold on to the same two pieces here. You got the, the seat rail and the handlebar and then just push up and it will get up on there for you. So as I said earlier, you have two brakes on the handlebars. On the right side is your front brake. On the left side is your rear brake. Unlike a bicycle, the front brake on your scooter is your friend. You have about 70% of your braking power is going to come out of the front brake. Just about 30% on the back brake and you can really feel it if you ride one of these. You can almost just ride with the back brake on. It won't stop you. Your best bet is to just squeeze both smoothly 
and evenly to come to a stop. Don't get in the habit of just relying on one or the other. Uh, do them at the same time. You'll find that you stop uh, in a lot more predictable way. It's just a smoother way to come to a stop. There are certain times where you would want to use a certain break over another. Um, one example would be if you're on some kind of loose terrain, a dirt road, a gravel road, something like that heading downhill or flat, uh, you could use the back brake to slow yourself down because the weight is gonna be over it, chances are you're not really gonna slide. You wouldn't wanna use a lot of front brake going down a slippery surface like dirt or gravel because you could just kind of lock up that brake and, and wash out, fall down. Um, Going backwards, if you have to back out of a, of a situation, maybe you have to back down a driveway sometimes, that's a bit steep, kind of like at my house. Um, I, then obviously you're going this way, so you would want to use the brake that is now the back, right? So you would use the front brake, which becomes your new back brake if you're going in reverse. Various things. Just think about that stuff. A lot of it carries over from bike riding, and some of it is that you just have to ride to know what the best thing to do is. The experience will come to you. While I'm here, you can see that the angular mirrors give the Sprint a pretty modern twist. And also the kind of trapezoidal headlight is a homage back to the Sprint, the GL, and the SS180 from the 1960s. So a lot of people sometimes think that this headlight looks super modern, but this is the headlight they used in the 1960s. So it too is as classic as the circular headlight on the Primavera. You can see the headlight illuminated when the high beam is on, the bottom part of the headlight will also fill in. And then as we go down here, you can see the running lights, which are LED. After 2020, we were lucky enough to get full LED lights in the US market, just like the rest of the world. So we have LED headlight, LED brake light, and LED running light in the back, and also the running lights in the front. Sort of unfortunately in our market, we also don't get the in-body turn signals that the rest of the world gets. Good news is there are some things you can do about this if you absolutely can't stand these pod turn signals. There is a European turn signal conversion kit where it puts these back into the body. You can also get a different wiring kit that we keep in stock uh, to convert these dead bulbs in the US market, because they don't do anything because they're not turn signals, into an additional running light or an additional brake light. So when you put that brake, all this stuff would light up. You'd get this one and these two, or just have this running light be replicated in there as well. Just more visibility for you to keep you safer on the road. All right, moving down from the handlebars a bit, we're going to go to the VIN plate. It's going to show you various details about the bike. The first one is your VIN number on your scooter is going to start in this black and go all the way through the uh, stamped in number on this grayer part. Up here, you're going to see that the gross vehicle weight rating of the scooter is 705 pounds. That means you and a passenger or you and whatever you're carrying can be up to 705 pounds before the scooter is really struggling. I personally wouldn't put that much weight on the scooter. It's a slower engine as it is, so it's going to drop you down out of that 30 range, guaranteed, that 30 mile an hour range. Next below that, you have a lot of different stuff here, but the main thing you're looking at in this pile of text is the front tire is going to require 26 PSI and the back is going to require 31.9. Now, it's totally fine to round that stuff up. You can be at 27 and 32, it's just stay within range and always go by this uh, plate instead of what's on the tire because the tire is gonna tell you what the actual tire can handle, which is going to be way more than what uh, the bike wants the tire to be to maintain traction and stability and everything else. Keep an eye on your tire pressure. Between the road and you is just the tire. So every month or so, you should be checking your tires. Just get a standard like kind of pen size air pressure checker and uh, fill that thing up. It's all it takes to fill up the tires is just a normal Schrader valve, uh, bicycle pump, or an air compressor if you have one at your house or at a gas station. And on the front, it's right here. Same deal, just uh, spin the valve cap, stem cap off and fill it with air. So to access the under seat storage, you're going to actually have to take the key out and open the seat manually. On the 150cc scooters, this particular button right here would be an electronic seat actuator. Uh, that is not the case on the, the 50s, that does nothing. Don't push on it, uh, it does nothing. You're gonna have to take the key out and stick the key into the seat and turn and lift. Under the seat, you're going to see a few things. We'll start here at the top. This is a tool kit that's included with every Vespa. Uh, it's got a spark plug puller, a shock adjuster, and some various drivers in there to uh, take out some of the Torx fasteners found on the scooter. A lot of people don't even know they have that tool kit because Vespas are reliable 
and they don't need it. Below that, we've got a service sticker. So not everybody does this, but here at Vespa Portland, we put a sticker underneath your seat to tell you when your next service is due and who was the last person who did the service and also if it was a major or if it had a valve adjustment. You can call the number below to schedule a service. Moving down, you're going to see uh, the seat storage bucket. The classic no pets sticker is on here. You've also got some posts right there to hang your helmet if it doesn't fit underneath the seat. And chances are it won't because this storage, while being fairly decently sized, still isn't exactly large enough for most full face helmets or even three quarter helmets. You'll also see a bunch of regulatory stickers and things like Bianco, the paint code for this particular bike. As we move back, you've also got your gas cap under here. You can pump your own gas in Oregon on a motorcycle or scooter. You cannot do that here in a car, as many of you know, but from you watching afar, that's how we're living out here. Uh, you're gonna wanna use premium gas in there, 91 or 92 octane, whatever is available. And lastly, if you wanted to take it out, you can remove the underseat storage to gain access to the engine below. But again, you don't really need to. That's mostly for your service center uh, when you come in for your scheduled services. And on the back, you've got a grab rail, which looks pretty good. It's also angular, so it, it kind of has the same aesthetic as the headlight and the mirrors. Kind of ties the whole look together. If you want, you can change this out at some point with a flat rack to add a top case, a folding rack, whatever, or just leave it as the kind of stylish grab rail. One thing I recommend is that you never put your keys in the underseat storage bucket. If this closes on you, you have no way to get your keys. So just leave them up here in the lock as you kind of do whatever business you're doing down under the seat. And then to close the seat, of course, you just close it. One often forgotten about detail on the front of the seat on the Sprint and Primavera 50 and 150 is the seat hook right here. It slides right out. It's a little bag hook that you can hang things on. Kind of fun fact, they used to call this the curry hook in the mod days, 19. 50s, 60s England, they would hang uh, their to-go curry on the hook of their vintage scooter and take off. Now, uh, I don't know, hang a burrito on there and then slide it away when you don't need it. I don't know how it goes in every single state, but in Oregon, you're not legally allowed to have a passenger on what's classified as a moped by the DMV. Um, that said, they do use the same frame as the 150cc scooter, which is fully legal to have a passenger on. So you do still have the room to put someone right here on the back, and they have passenger foot pegs down here for their feet on both sides of the scooter. Wouldn't really recommend a passenger on a 50. It's gonna be real slow adding that extra weight, but if you really had to do it, you could do it and check your local laws about whether or not uh, you can do that legally. The battery on your scooter is located at the floorboards right there. The included toolkit will have the Torx driver needed to remove those fasteners, and then uh, also the Phillips head screwdriver uh, underneath there to take the actual battery out. Uh, as long as you treat your battery well, ride your scooter every few weeks, don't let it sit for months and months on end. Uh, your battery should last you a good few years, especially if you're storing it inside. You can probably get four, potentially five years out of the quality Yuasa battery that ships with the Piaggio. And when your battery does go out someday, which it will, replace it with something quality and you won't have to mess with it every year or two. A Yuasa battery is gonna be in the 90 buck range and it's gonna last you for uh, three, three to five years, assuming you're riding and you are storing it uh, indoors. The wheels on the Vespa Sprint are 12 inch aluminum alloy and they're a sporty design. You're gonna have a disc brake on the front wheel and a drum brake on the back. The Sprint 50 has a fuel injected four stroke air-cooled three horsepower engine. Maybe that doesn't mean anything to you. Ultimately, it's smooth and quiet, and fuel injection means that you can actually let this scooter sit for a little while if there are some months where you're not gonna be riding too often because it's too cold or too rainy or too snowy or whatever in your area. Ideally, you're going to be storing this scooter in a garage or under some kind of cover in those conditions, and even more ideally, you'd be hooking it up to a battery tender uh, to ensure that your battery is healthy and still alive when you want to ride it again. But that's mainly if you're gonna be storing it without riding at all for months on end. If you're riding at least once a week or once every two, three weeks on this thing for you know, a few miles, you're probably gonna be fine to let it sit for a little while, especially if you have a quality battery. The Vespa Sprint is just a touch over six feet long, and then the wheelbase is just a touch under four and a half feet long. The scooter is also 
a little bit over two and a half feet wide from lever to lever. The mirrors are going to add some there, but they'll change based on where you have them. If you're a larger rider, they might be out. If you're a shorter rider, they might be in. Uh, but I would say that would add potentially another eight inches or so uh, because of the way the sprint mirror is where it kind of points out. The seat height is 31.1 inches. Now, if you're a shorter rider, you're probably gonna to wanna to come sit on one of these at your local dealer and make sure that it's comfortable for you. Ideally, you're getting both feet on the ground at a dead stop, but a lot of riders that are shorter have gotten used to just putting one foot down. Whatever is comfortable for you, if it's not comfortable for you, you won't wanna ride, so double check that you like how it feels and if you can manage the weight of it. Speaking of weight, you're looking at 255 pounds with most of that center of gravity and the majority of the weight of the scooter below you. Uh, underneath the seat in the engine and rear wheel assembly. That makes it real easy to get around. You can kind of shift your hips over and kind of change lanes real easy. It just feels easy to manage because the weight is down low. You can accessorize your Vespa Sprint or really any Vespa with a lot of different things. If you'd like a windscreen, there's clear and smoked configurations in small sizes, tall sizes, etc. You can add heated grips to these if you want to, which is fantastic, especially in our climate. On the back, you can add a flat rack, a folding rack, a top case with a rack, uh, various things like that. Like I said earlier, you can change out the, the turn signals to the European kit or add that kit to make uh, extra lighting in the back. And on and on and on. You can add cup holders down low on the battery, uh, etc. There's a lot of things going on with the Vespa and because it's such a premier brand that's been around forever, you know, people make things for it. Uh, a lot of it's stock, some of it's aftermarket, but still quality. Some of it's aftermarket, but not as good. Um, you know, read about things, talk to your local dealer uh, about what you want to do, and we can point you to the direction of something that's going to kind of last you and, and, you know, be of good value for what you're trying to do. All right, let's talk about servicing. Your first service on any new Vespa is going to be 625 miles. At that point, you're going to want to contact your local dealer and get on the schedule for your first service. And that one's important because you want to get all these break-in fluids out of your scooter. Um, get those things refreshed and then get back on the road. Make sure it's all breaking in nice and everything looks good. That's also a chance for your local dealership to look over your scooter and see if there's anything going on with it um, that might become a warranty issue in the future. Most of the time these things come in pretty perfectly from the factory, but um, worth having a set of eyes on it. After that 625 mile service, uh, the next time you'll need to come in is at 3,100 miles. We can round these things into 600, 3,000, 6,000, etc. Roughly every 3,000 miles after your first service, you're gonna to wanna to come back. Uh, the 3,000 mile service is a routine service, mostly fluid changes, a few other things. And then the 6,000 mile service is what's called a major service. That is where you're going to replace the belt and rollers in the transmission back there. And um, obviously another fluid refresh, etc. cetera. Uh, keep up on those things because if something was ever to go wrong with your bike warranty wise, the manufacturer is going to want to see records that you took care of the scooter. Your scooter comes with a two-year unlimited mile manufacturer warranty that protects against manufacturer defects. You can also get an extended warranty if you would like, which extends it another two years to a four-year uh, total length. Having a warranty from the manufacturer or even the extended warranty doesn't mean that your services are free. It means that if something goes wrong with your bike, you start hearing a weird noise, something like that, that that diagnostic work to determine what that is and to fix it is uh, covered under the manufacturer warranty, assuming you didn't do something crazy to it. If you crash the bike, that's not under warranty. That's not the manufacturer's fault. Uh, but if it's making some kind of noise or a light is staying on or something seems kind of weird to you, drop it by your local dealer. Well, call first ideally and get on the schedule to have that thing taken a look at and then that repair, assuming it's something actually uh, problematic, would be covered under your warranty and free for you. So lastly, we'll get into pricing and color options. At the time of filming this video, it's January 2022, uh, the Sprint 50 colors are red, white, yellow, and black. The MSRP on the Sprint 50 is $4,099 for the standard configuration. For $100 more, you step into the Racing 60s edition. That's what I'm standing with here. And there are two types of that. There's the white with the red stripes, as you see here, also including the gold wheels, and also a green with a yellow stripe, uh, also including gold wheels. The MSRP on the Racing 60s edition of the Sprint 50 is going to be $4,199 at the time of filming this. 
The next step up is the Sprint Sport 50. That's gonna be available in just two colors. It's a matte blue and a matte titanium as of the time of filming this video. And the MSRP on that one is 4,249. The reason I keep saying at the time of filming is that Vespa will change the colors and sometimes we don't know about it until it shows up. Um, they generally change every two years. So we're kind of coming to the end of that if I remember correctly. So the colors on these in the next eight months could be different. Probably not much different, but could be different. Between those model configurations, the standard, the Racing 60s and the Sprint Sport, nothing else changes on the bike. It's the same frame, the same ergonomics, same internals, all of that. It is entirely an appearance package. It's cosmetic changes, different color bike, different color wheels, that sort of thing, different color mirrors, etc. cetera. Uh, as you can see on the Racing 60s version, there's a lot of blacked out uh, kind of trim pieces. You got black trim here, you got black mirrors, you got black bezel, you got a black little fairing right here. That is chrome uh, on most of the other sprints. So on top of those MSRPs, you're going to need to factor in other things when you're purchasing. You're going to have freight and setup charges, you're going to have local taxes, and you're going to have DMV fees title registration, processing, et cetera. And all of that stuff is going to vary from state to state, city to city, dealer to dealer. Um, DMV could be different by county, et cetera. And nobody wants to see you stop riding, but if you do, the New York Times put an article out a few years ago at this point uh, that said the Vespa has the highest resale value of any vehicle on the road. Roughly three years into having one, uh, a used one in good condition will still be something crazy, like 75% of value. Um, partly because Vespa has competitors in, in terms of there are other scooters out there, but they are just frankly not as nice as a Vespa. Um, the build quality of these things, the fit and finish is, it's top notch. The Vespa is the champagne of scooters and you can feel it when you ride them. So just know that if you're kind of investing, you know, a little more into a Vespa like this, if you decide it's not for you, you're going to probably be able to recoup quite a bit of money uh, through a private sale. So there you have it. The Vespa Sprint 50 is a sporty, modern, and fun way to get around your town. If you're interested in getting one of these things and we are your local dealer, give us a call at 503-222-3779. You can also text or uh, reach us on the contact form on our website. If you're in a different city, talk to your local dealer. Go on Vespa.com and, and search out uh, where your closest one is. It's also worth saying that at the time of filming this, January 2020, Supply chain issues are still causing big delays all around the world. And so if the scooter that you want isn't sitting on the floor at your local dealership, uh, you might have to wait a little while. Most people who've wanted scooters we didn't have in stock are waiting anywhere between one to three months. Generally, it's more on the two to three range at this point, just because a lot of people want these things just like they want bicycles and surfboards and everything else uh, for recreation in the last couple of years. And scooters are no different. Uh, these things are kind of hard to come by. So don't expect a lot of deals when you head to a place. Most places don't have much prior year inventory at all uh, left. And most people can't get the bike they're asking for. So I don't want to make it sound too dire, but if you want one of these things and you know which one it is, which color, and you're married to that color, you're going to want to talk to your local dealer and get a deposit in and get on the list so that the next one that comes in is yours. The downside of right now is that when this scooter sells, I don't know when the next one shows up. And this actually happens to be our very last Sprint 50 in the whole building, which is why we're doing this video, so I can show it to you before somebody comes and gets it. One thing to maybe consider though, is that yeah, color is important, but do you wanna ride now, or do you wanna wait two, three, four months? Maybe you wanna ride now. Maybe white versus red is not that big a difference in the grand scheme of things, and having more fun riding around now is better. That's ultimately up to you to decide. But that's about it for the Vespa Sprint 50. If you have any more questions, please leave them in the comment section below. We'll write back to you. That is all. Thank you for watching. This is Andrew here at Vespa Portland, and we will see you in the next video.